Let's read in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb, so she ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. Now, that other disciple, by the way, is John, the author of this gospel. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter came also. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, then entered the tomb, saw and believed that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went home again. But Mary stood outside facing the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where Jesus' body had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Supposing that he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've removed him, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. Jesus said, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. In the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because of fear of the Jews. Then Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Well, the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ is by far the most important event in the history of mankind. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, right? Now, we're not talking here about the resuscitation of Jesus Christ. This is resurrection. Now, Lazarus, we talked about last week, Lazarus was resuscitated. He was dead, Jesus raised him, but he was still in the same physical body and the same nature that he had before. And Lazarus, who knows how many years later, experienced physical death again, and this time he didn't come back from it. But Jesus experienced complete physical death, and then he was resurrected. And it is on that point that the entirety of Christianity rests. And so on Resurrection Sunday, I think it's very fitting that we should look at three very important points about the resurrection. Did it really happen? If so, what does resurrection look like and how is it different from the life that we have? And then most importantly at all, why does it matter to me? Now I saw a headline in the Portland, Oregonian this morning. Christians celebrate ancient ritual. And I'm thinking, oh, is that how the world sees the resurrection? As an ancient ritual, as if we have to sort of dust off the cobwebs of this old and tired thing that's just ready to fall by the wayside. Because after all, we think in new ways now. We embrace new things. We ought to have new truths, a new way of looking at life. This old Christianity Resurrection Sunday, it's passe. And I think you'll agree with me. That is the attitude of a lot of people 
in the world today. So let's take a look at that very first question because it is, in fact, the most important one. Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ an ancient tradition or historical fact? If there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Period. End of sentence. Paul the Apostle wrote to the church at Corinth and he said this, If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation, that is, going out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, it's without foundation. And so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, in fact, if the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you're still in your sins. But why would that be? Without resurrection, there is nothing to hope for beyond this life. We just simply cease to exist. Or we get annihilated in some way. Or, if you happen to believe in reincarnation, you just come back as various different forms of physical life. And I, I guess the idea is you're supposed to get better and better and eventually you reach nirvana or the great Eck or some other thing. <laughs> The resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely central to Christianity. Oh, by the way, according to the Bible, everyone will experience resurrection. That there are actually two destinies that mankind will face. Only two, not a myriad of different ones. One is filled with light and goodness and joy and peace and healing. The other, which is actually called the second death, is not filled with any of those things, but with the opposite. So what determines your destiny, according to the Bible, is who owns you. We'll talk more about that later. But how do we know? How do we know that Jesus actually rose up from the dead? It's a serious question, and I think it's one that's really important. Now, historians use various different means to ascertain whether something actually happened in history, okay? We have archaeological evidence, which means that they dig up something that they can prove existed at a particular point in time and then verifies or disallows some fact in history. Now, I find it interesting because throughout the ages, historians and archaeologists alike have put down the Bible as an ancient tradition, but not based upon fact. But it's interesting, and I, I uh, subscribe to a magazine called Biblical Archaeology, partly for this reason, and that is when archaeologists make discoveries and they are excavating old cities and, and in Israel as well, Every time there has been a discovery, it is actually verified what the Bible already said. We've never had a case where something that the Bible very clearly stated has actually been shown to be in error because of archaeological evidence. But there's another way that we can um, determine as close as we can about the truth of whether something actually happened in history. And that is something called eyewitness testimony. Something that someone literally saw, they wrote it down in a form that could be preserved, and then that is passed down through the generations. Now, um, one of the most interesting discoveries that was made um, in the fairly recent past were a whole bunch of jugs in a cave near the Dead Sea. They were stored way back in this cave and uh, when they opened it up, and they had to be very careful because these, these jugs were all sealed up and everything, uh, and inside were scrolls. The reason the scrolls were preserved is because the Dead Sea, if you think about the name, 
It's the Dead Sea. Uh, around the Dead Sea, it looks a lot like, um, uh, like a desert. It, it's just really, really barren. It's, it's as barren as you can imagine. So it's very, very dry. The lack of moisture made it so that these scrolls survived for millennia. They unrolled these scrolls very carefully, and what they found is it was the Bible. So they were able to actually go back and compare the biblical text that we have today with these ancient scrolls that they verified had been stored there in those caves for thousands of years, and guess what happened? It matched the Bible. Now, this was not the New Testament, of course. This was the Old Testament, but absolutely incredible. So a combination of kind of archaeological evidence, but also something that someone wrote down that came down to us through the ages that actually showed that the Bible was, in fact, accurate the way we have it today. Having eyewitnesses is an important element in determining whether something actually happened or not. Having witnesses from more than one source who are independent and did not know each other is also a helpful fact. Having witnesses that, um, that lived closer to the time when the events took place is also a benefit to helping to determine whether something actually happened. Now, for the existence and the fact of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we actually have very important eyewitness testimony that we can go off of. And one of which are actually the, the letters uh, of the New Testament that we have in front of us this morning. We just read from one of those letters, which is the Gospel of John. And, and you can really look at it apart from... Uh, belief in Christ and, and, and uh, in sort of a religious sense, but just from a historical sense. Like I mentioned, the, uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls showed us that the Old Testament had come down to us today intact. Well, we also have manuscripts of the New Testament books that have come down to us intact as well. In fact, the New Testament is the most accurately uh, translated and, and text brought down of any other ancient text. I mean, you think about Plato and, and um, Aristotle, Aristotle and all these guys. Um, their, the manuscripts of their writings are just filled with errors and embellishments and all kinds of stuff. But the New Testament letters come down to us intact. Ah, oh, there are a couple little places where they're not quite sure what the original was. But nothing that would actually obscure um, the, the meaning of these texts. So we can actually just look at them as historical pieces of evidence. John wrote these words down. He was an eyewitness to the things that took place about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there are also independent historians that we can look at to know that, one, the Romans did, in fact, crucify Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, one of those individuals is a man by the name of Josephus. Now, Josephus was a Jewish historian, and he lived around the time that Jerusalem was captured in 70 AD. And he wrote, his, the book of his writings is really, really thick. And he actually talks about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, and I don't have it in my notes for some reason, it didn't come through on my iPad, but okay. But uh, if you go to our website later, calvarynewberg.org, and you click on the study notes, you can actually read what Josephus said about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He wrote it down as a historic fact. So another person that we know who was uh, independent of the gospel writers is a man by the name of Tacitus. And he was a historian who wrote in the second century. And he was writing about the destruction of Rome. And, and Nero, uh, Caesar Nero, set Rome on fire. And um, he did it in part, Tacitus tells us, because of this man named Christus. And he, he got the name just a little bit wrong, but historians agree this is a reference to Jesus Christ. We also, of course, have Paul the Apostle. The reason that Paul the Apostle is an important person in this is because Paul, at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, was an absolute enemy of this way. He would have done anything, in fact, did do anything he could to stomp it out. He put people to death 
who believed that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, had actually raised up from the dead and been resurrected. But Paul very clearly states over and over again that he saw the risen Christ. And that's what turned him from being an enemy to being a follower of Jesus. We have James, the brother or half-brother of the Lord. James did not believe that his brother, Jesus, was the Messiah. In fact, he and the whole family gathered around Jesus at one point, and they wanted him to take him to the insane asylum. They thought he was nuts. But James also became a believer in his half-brother as the Messiah after the resurrection. Paul records for us that not only did the disciples see Jesus raised from the dead, not only did Paul see him, not only did James see him, but 500 disciples saw this guy having been raised from the dead. Now that's what I call eyewitness testimony. Something else that we know of that helps us to understand the factual basis upon which the crucifixion and the resurrection is based, and that is the tomb is empty. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, and as we read on, at our Good Friday service, he was buried in a garden tomb that was nearby where the crucifixion took place. It was a new tomb that had never been used. And what they did with these uh, is they, they uh, had a very large multi-ton stone that was uh, rolled up hill of the entrance to the tomb and then kind of held in place. And then they would bring the body into the tomb, lay it down on a stone, and then they would roll this stone into place over the front of the tomb. And then in this particular case, it was sealed with a Roman seal. So then after the resurrection, the disciples of Jesus began to proclaim this in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Well, I don't know about you, but if I had a guy that got executed and they buried him in a tomb in a known location, rolled a stone in front of it and sealed it, what would you do? I would go to the authorities and I would say, I want to please exhume this body. These guys are saying that this guy is alive again, and there's just no way. So let's go down and prove them to be inaccurate. Let's go down to the tomb right now. That would have been so easy to do. And there were plenty of people who wanted that to, ta to take place. They wanted to disprove the resurrection. But they didn't, because the tomb was empty. Now, as we read another gospel, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of Israel, were so worried about the resurrection, they didn't even stop to think, wait, we had the guy killed and he came back from the dead, maybe that means he is the Messiah and we should worship him. No, they weren't going there at all. What they did is they concocted this story. They said, we're going to tell the Romans because uh, if the Roman guards let their prisoner escape, like the dead guy in the tomb, they would forfeit their lives. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, we'll make it good with the Roman officials. We'll say, his disciples came and stole him away. And they paid a sum of money to these guys to shut him up. And so that rumor started spreading around. Well, there are two problems with this rumor, that Jesus was dead, but they just came and they got his body. Uh, one is the fact that um, actually, there's multiple, now that I think about it, there are multiple problems with this scenario. Uh, one is that uh, the, the disciples had a, a, a price on their head every bit, as, every bit as much as Jesus did. And so uh, for them to just make a bunch of noise and come and take this body away, uh, they would have drawn a whole lot of attention and the Jews would have grabbed them and told the Romans to execute them. And we know that the disciples were fearful of that very thing because as we looked at this morning, um, they had the doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. It says there in John 20, verse 19. But the second fact, uh, the second problem is that in order for them to have freed Jesus or taken the body away, they would have had to have fought past a, 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 a patrol or a garrison or what, I don't know what in the world it was, but a group of Roman soldiers. Okay, Roman soldiers, they're not just, you know, weekend warriors. 
These aren't just like reservists who like just kind of lean against their spears. These were trained soldiers who were used to warfare. They were used to riots. They were, they were like, you know, the SWAT team in their riot gear guarding this tomb with their lives because they knew they'd be killed if they didn't do their job. So here comes this group of fishermen to fight against the Roman soldiers. And we know because of what happened during the arrest of Jesus, Peter, who was the leader of this band of merry men, wasn't exactly what you'd call good with a sword. In the, in the account of the arrest of Jesus, we know that, that Simon Peter took a sword and man, he was going to cut the heads off of anybody who tried to take his Lord. And he swung that sword back and he took aim and what did he manage to do? He cut some guy's ear off. Wow, that's dangerous. Man, I'm quaking in my boots if I'm a Roman soldier. Peter and the boys are coming. We're going to get out of here. I don't think so. So then there's another possibility and that is that Jesus didn't actually die. He didn't get resurrected because he never died in the first place. That the Roman soldiers, um, you know, they beat him, they scourged him, and they crucified him, but they didn't kill him. And that the coolness of the tomb and the coolness of the rock upon which he laid worked to revive this person, Jesus, and so he basically woke up. He didn't die. He just was hurt really bad, and he looked like he was dead. Okay, let's talk about that one. Uh, problem number one. Did you know that the Romans were probably the most expert executioners that have ever existed? Uh, there was a group of Roman soldiers who were put in charge of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion, as we talked about on Friday, is probably the most brutal form of execution that uh, man has ever invented. It was designed to be a long and tortuous death. Men and women who were put on crosses sometimes suffered for weeks before they finally died of exposure. But when the Roman soldiers put Jesus on the cross and the two thieves that were on his right and his left, the religious leaders said to the Roman soldiers, you know, uh, we want to be able to worship the Lord and we don't want this body of this Jewish guy left up on the cross because if you've been put, placed upon a wooden pole, the law says you're cursed. So take, would you please kill these guys and take them down? So the Roman soldiers, again, experts in, in, in the form of execution, they came along and they broke the legs of the two thieves on either side of Jesus. And what that did is that it didn't allow the legs to be used uh, to lift up the rib cage so that the person could breathe. And so very quickly, the person would literally suffocate to death. When they came to Jesus and the soldier looked at him, he said, this guy's already dead. Now, the reason that happened, of course, is because Jesus actually gave up his spirit. You, you can't do that, by the way. It, only the Messiah is able to actually say, okay, Lord, this is it. He said, it is finished. So he gave up his spirit and he was dead. So the Roman soldiers know what death looks like. And if you're an executioner and you have put hundreds, if not thousands of people to death, you also know what death looks like. Now, just to make sure... <clears throat> one of the Roman soldiers thrust his, his spear into the side of the Lord, and out came a mixture of blood and water, which showed that uh, this body, this person, was no longer living. It's one of the evidences that we have that Jesus Christ actually physically died. Well, okay, so let's say maybe, you know, 39 lashes, which normally would kill a person, Crucifixion, which most certainly would. The witness of the Roman centurion who knew that Jesus was dead. Okay, maybe none of that really counts. Maybe Jesus did come back alive in the tomb. All right, now, I'm back alive. It's pitch black in here. What do I need to do? Okay, no problem. All I need to do to escape 
I've been beaten, I've been scourged, and I've been crucified, so I'm probably very weak. But my only thing that stands between me and freedom is rolling a two-ton stone uphill from the inside with no way of having a handhold on it. No problem, you say, right? You know, I don't think so. There's a, there's a, there's a saying in the medical profession, when you hear hoofbeats, don't think zebras. You know, and that is, you know, if somebody's got a cough, don't say, oh, you've got SARS, you know, or Ebola. Think you've got a rhinovirus, you've got a cold. Well, in this case, the Roman soldiers said Jesus was dead. They put him in a tomb, they rolled a stone in front of it, and they sealed it with a Roman, a Roman seal and guarded it with soldiers. I hear hoofbeats and I know it's horses. Jesus died. But his tomb was empty. They didn't come and take him away. I believe that these pieces of evidence show us fairly conclusively that the resurrection of Jesus was a historical fact. It did actually take place. So if it was real, what does a resurrected person look like and how is that different from uh, a person just like you and me? Well, one, we see that uh, Jesus had a real physical body. Uh, physicality is not a bad thing. You will have a physical body for all of eternity. Mary, as we saw here in John 20, verse 17, she was hugging Jesus. Um, she, she was clinging him, clinging to him. It's like, you know, they took my Lord away, and when I have got him again, I am not letting him go. And she was like hanging on to him with all of her might, and that's why he said, uh, don't, don't hang on to me. I've got to go back to my father because he's going to give the Holy Spirit. And it would be kind of hard to walk around with Mary sort of, you know, clinging to his feet the whole time. Um, secondly, he showed, in verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side. So Jesus had a physical body that could be touched. In fact, he invited Thomas, the disciple that wasn't there at this meeting on um, Resurrection Sunday, he invited Thomas to put his finger in the nail prints and into his side. So yes, Jesus had a physical body. And in fact, in Luke chapter 24, in Luke's account of the resurrection, Jesus, they didn't believe that he was real. They thought maybe he was a ghost. And so Jesus said, what have you got to eat? And so they gave him some broiled fish and he ate it in their presence. Jesus' body in the resurrection is physical. However, there's at least one major difference between our bodies and his in the resurrection, and that is that his body is indestructible. Life without end. You can't touch Jesus. You can't do anything to it. His, his physical body when he was here um, got hungry, got thirsty. When it got cut, it bled. When he was crucified, he died. But after the resurrection, his body became indestructible. And he promised to us in John chapter 8, verse 52, he says, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death, ever. Now what he meant by that is, when you do die in this age, you receive a resurrected body as well. One that is physical, but one that is indestructible. Now Jesus' body was a little bit different from the one that he had. One of the reasons we think that is because people didn't like instantly recognize him as Jesus. Now there are actually some reasons for that. There's a, another account about the, uh, the two dudes on the road to Emmaus. Um, they were taken off, I don't know that dudes, is, I think that's sort of a scribal embellishment here, but anyway, <laughs> they were on their way to Emmaus. They were bummed and Jesus came up and joined them in the walk. He said, sup guys, what's, what's going on? And they said, how come you're so happy? Haven't you heard about what's happened in Jerusalem? No, no, tell me about it. What's going on? And so they began to tell him about the crucifixion of Jesus. And so he began, began to share with them, and boy, would I have loved to have been there for that Bible study. It says he shared to them throughout the scriptures about how the Messiah must die and then be raised from the dead. An incredible, incredible Bible study. But they didn't know it was Jesus until he broke bread. 
And then suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized who it was. In um, the account that we're looking at here this morning, where in verse 15, woman, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And it says, supposing he was the gardener. She replied, sir, if you've removed him, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. So somehow Mary didn't recognize Jesus. But there are a couple reasons why that could be. Number one, remember, we started out by saying it's early in the morning, okay? Uh, early while it was still dark. So it's not always easy to recognize people early in the morning. Secondly, Mary had been crying, weeping, and so uh, her eyes were probably um, swollen with tears, and you know, so it's, it's harder for her to see there as well. And the way that the account happens in John, um, it says, having, verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus, and, and then Jesus says something to her. And then um, in, verse, in the latter half of verse 16, it says, turning around. Well, hadn't she already turned around? What I think happened is she heard an, a, vo uh, a voice or a noise behind her, and Mary turns like this. It's dark. She's been crying. She sees somebody in the, in the uh, growing light, and then she turns back again because she didn't recognize who it was in that, in that moment. And then he talks to her. Then when he says her name, there's something about the voice of Jesus. He said, Mary. And then she knew. And then she turned back around, looked at him more carefully, and realized, it's him. It's him. And so then, of course, it was, you know, like diving for the end zone to, uh, to, to hang on to Jesus. There's another possible reason, too. And that is, you know, Jesus was really beat up at the crucifixion. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, which is about the crucifixion of Christ, talks about his, his visage being marred more than any other human. I mean, he, he, you wouldn't have recognized him at all because of what the Roman soldiers did to him. But yet in the resurrection, he's to his best self. 33 years old, prime of his life, and he'll be that way forever. So he looked pretty bad at the crucifixion, but he looked really good at the resurrection. I kind of like that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to being 33 again, you know? <laughs> and never change. So maybe his form was a little bit different because just maybe it was a little bit better. And I like that because I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, another interesting thing about the resurrected body is it doesn't have to obey the laws of this creation. You notice that the disciples, again, had locked the doors so nobody gets in. And then suddenly there's Jesus in. He's inside the room. How did he get there? Well, he could just, I guess, he could just appear wherever he wanted to be at whatever time he wanted to be. This, the, the laws of physics of this age don't apply to him anymore. So I like that. But another thing that's interesting, and, and, and finally, is that the body that Jesus died in, even though it was resurrected, it was made of the same constituent elements in some way. Why do I say that? Because it still bore the nail prints in his hand hands and the spear in his side where the spear went in. So I think we gather from that that a resurrected body is something like the bodies that we have now, just really cool and powerful and indestructible, but still a physical body. So I think that's neat. We're not going to just be angels floating around, sitting on clouds, playing harps, and wearing white robes and wings. I don't know where anybody got that. It's certainly not from the scriptures. So, if the resurrection took place, and we kind of know a little bit about what a resurrected body is like, what does it mean to me? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important to me? The very first and foremost important element of the, of the resurrection 
is that it means that the atoning death and sacrifice of Jesus' life in place of yours was accepted by the Father as sufficient to pay for your sins. If you remember back to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that we looked at earlier, if there is no resurrection, then you are still in your sins. The reason that Jesus came to earth in the first place is that we humans had rebelled against our Creator, and that rebellious attitude that the Bible calls sin basically has infected every one of us coming down from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Simply put, God is too good to be in the presence of anything that is not like Him. And if you were to, for instance, open the doors of a nuclear reactor and go into the core and hope to survive, you would be stupid. And that's nothing compared to what it would be like as a rebellious human infected with sin trying to go into the presence of God. You simply wouldn't be able to survive. He's too good. The only way you could be with God is if you can be like God. But this problem of our sin separates us from God. Now you think, well, you know, I've been pretty good though. My sins aren't really that bad. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a serial killer after all, so God ought to let me in, just kind of on balance. I've done more good things than bad, and isn't it when I do a good thing it sort of erases a bad thing I've done? Isn't that like what they call karma or something like that? So I think God, God would let me into heaven because I've been basically a pretty good person. Well, the problem with that is that we think that's all good, and I think we make that up to feel good about our situation, but that doesn't mean that's reality. It doesn't mean that it's truth. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if you have even one defect, and, and what would a defect be? What, what would that look like? You know, you know murder, uh, you know, embezzling, you know, you're just a horrible, awful person. Well, yeah, those, those are definitely qualified as defects that would keep you out of the presence of God. But did you know that telling one lie is also enough? Now, if any of you who can say, I have never lied in my entire life, I'd like you to raise your hand right now. I've never, ever told a lie. Now, see, if anybody had raised their hands, I would have said, you're guilty of the sin of pride. <laughs> and you probably told a lie by raising your hand, saying you've never lied. One lie, it's enough. Wow. See, a hard grader, isn't he? Yeah. Again, because he's just so good. And you say, well, you know, what? isn't that kind of unfair that he gets to decide what's good and what's not? Don't I get a say? No. <laughs> I didn't make this stuff up. Man didn't make this stuff up. God is who he is. And by his nature, he is so good that anything that's not good just can't do it. It's just an impossibility. So the only way to do it is the only way to be able to be with God is if something makes us good. And so mankind has tried forever to make themselves good by doing all kinds of good things and following a bunch of rules and regulations. And if I'm really good, I can make myself better. It's interesting because the scriptures tell us that the best of mankind, the best thing that you could have ever done compared to the goodness of God is like a filthy rag that ought to be thrown out. And it's actually grosser than that, but I won't go into it. You can't make yourself good. You can only be good if someone else makes you good. And that's why Jesus came. Because Jesus, unlike all of us, he was not infected with the sin gene, with that rebellious heart that is in mankind. The prophets tell us that the, the heart is deceitfully wicked. But Jesus didn't have that heart because his father was God the Father. And so when he was born, he had no sin. And the Bible says that he who had no sin, who knew no sin, became sin for us. So in other words, God took everything you have ever thought, done, or said that is against the character of God, outside of his character, and he took all of that stuff plus everything that anybody has ever done, and he laid those on the, on the shoulders of Jesus and said, I'm blaming you for it. 
He who knew no sin became sin for us. He never sinned, but God placed it upon his shoulders. He bore our iniquities, the Bible says. And then he died. But three days later, he came back. And it's that coming back that shows the sacrifice that Jesus performed to cleanse us from all of that stuff. Wash us completely seen, clean, as if you've never done anything wrong. The resurrection means God accepted it. Sacrifice accepted. Stamp clean on your life. All you have to do is, is, is join with that. Appropriate that. Say, I want that sacrifice on my behalf. I want to belong to Him now. Because you get that cleanliness by belonging to Jesus. You don't just get to go and make your own deal with God. You've got to come through Jesus. But it means that he paid the price for every bad thing you've ever done, and it means that he's restored that relationship with God forever. Now you think to yourself, okay, that's all well and good, but I'm already a Christian and I still do bad things. Welcome to the club. You are positionally clean. God looks at you, he sees the, the goodness that he sees in Jesus when he looks at you. And he sees you positionally clean. Now, practically speaking, we're still a work in progress. And I'm so glad for the patience of God. But if you were to die today and you realized, I blew it, I did some, you know, I got mad at somebody, I told a lie, you still get to go to heaven. It's not that we want to do those things. And God is in the process of weeding those things out from our character. But Jesus still paid for your sins, past, present, and future. So the resurrection means that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf, and it vindicates everything Jesus said and did. Everything. People love to cherry-pick Jesus, right? Especially the golden rule. I follow the golden rule because Jesus said it, and they kind of feel good because they follow something or try to that Jesus did. But it, it vindicated everything, he said. You have to take the whole thing. And part of the thing that you have to take is when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, either that was the most arrogant thing anybody has ever said, or it's true. And I'm just telling you that the resurrection, to me, very clearly proves if everything Jesus said was true, then this too is true. It's very exclusive. This is one of the things that people really focus on today, and they go, oh, you Christians are so narrow-minded. No, we're not, actually. But God has told us there's only one way back to Him and to have eternal life, and that is through His Son, Jesus. I think it was God's grace, because He knows how horrible we are at math. <laughs> and He knew if there were two ways... Then the people that were in the two camps of the two ways would say, well, my way is better than your way, and I'm going to show you. And that's actually kind of what's happened. But all the other ways are not actually real. But they like to make you think that they are. Nobody else makes this exclusive claim, though. So either Jesus was nuts, or he was arrogant, he was a, a serial liar, or he's absolutely true. And absolutely right. So what do we make of all this? And, and by the way, I've kind of skipped over a bunch of other things for lack of time this morning, and I would really encourage you to check out the rest of the study notes on our website later on, because there's a whole bunch of other things that make the resurrection very, very significant to us as believers. But what do we make of all this? Well, the book of Acts says there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. So if you want a relationship with God, if you want the goodness, the peace, the joy, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, you want Jesus. And there's ample evidence that he was crucified and good eyewitness testimony that he was raised from the dead. And if and if that's the case, then we can rejoice greatly if we belong to Him. It's all going to turn out good in the end. 
You know, have you ever watched a movie where it's there are a lot of cliffhangers and you're just not sure? Is the hero going to pull it out? Are they going to make it? And, and you know, as, as authors, we, we try to set you up for that stuff, right? In fact, they teach you to do that when you're learning how to write. You need to write your character into a corner that they can't possibly get out of. And then at the last moment, you think of a way that they can get out of that corner. You know, and so we're, we're like going, oh no, uh, I read in the, in the paper yesterday that by 2070, uh, Muslims will outnumber Christians in the world, you know, and, I'm, and, and we have lots of people now, even in the United States, that call themselves the nuns. They are not part of a Catholic order of, uh, of ladies. They are with no religious affiliation whatsoever. Um, read a book that was written, le written recently called The Post-Christian, or The Last Christian Generation. Uh, you know, we're, we're finding that um, Christianity is, is, is falling out of favor and, and supposedly Islam is becoming so much more popular. Actually, what's happening, they're just having more kids. It's true. But also Christianity is under attack. And what you believe is going to be attacked more and more. In fact, this last week, there were people who came from a nearby nation into the nation of Kenya. And they went into a university and they were looking to kill Christians. And they slaughtered nearly 150 of them. Our ministry partner in Kenya, Pastor Gideon Medeño, has spoken at that university on numerous occasions, emailed me right away as soon as it happened. His heart just breaks. In fact, my, the email that he sent me is over on the bulletin board there. You can read it. And I just encourage you to pray for Kenya. Pray for Pastor Medeño and Evelyn, his wife, and their ministry. It's going to get worse. But I kind of like that. Not that I'm like a glutton for punishment or anything. But there's this amazing thing that happens, like in China. When the Chinese government decided that Christianity was going to get stamped out, and they put people in jail by the droves, and it was, you thought, okay, this is it. What happened? Christianity flourished. Millions of people came to know Jesus. Yeah, they were meeting in underground churches. It was kind of like the first century in Rome. First and second centuries where the, uh, the Christians were, were persecuted like crazy. And yet the church flourished. But what I want to tell you, for all certainty, is that in the end, although it might seem like a cliffhanger now, like we're getting backed into a corner and, and things are going dark and, you know, oh no, Guess what? He wins in the end. And it, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like this wonderful Western, right? And at the end of the movie, when all seems the darkest, the hero rides in on a white horse together with his posse. <laughs> and he saves the day. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Because, yeah, he, Jesus isn't around physically right now. He left and left us in charge. Okay. Fortunately, he also left the Holy Spirit. But he is going to come back physically. And, and he's going to actually, all he has to do is speak, and all of his enemies will be destroyed. It's kind of incredible. But he's going to ride back on a white horse, and you and I, if we belong to him, are going to ride back as part of his posse. Yeehaw! <laughs> so, you know, I just, I want you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want you to seriously consider it. You know, if he really did rise from the dead, I mean, man, that is something to pay attention to. Now, don't let all the traditions and all the junk in the news, especially this last week about the stuff going on in Indiana and Arkansas, and it's like, these Christians are so bigoted and narrow-minded, they are just filled with hate. No, we're not. We love everyone. Jesus hung out with people that that society in his day would say, you guys are the scum of the earth. He hung out with prostitutes and, and people from the IRS, and everybody knows that <laughs> all people from the IRS are destined to go to hell, right? Everybody knows that. But Jesus hung out with them so much so, boy, I know I'm going to get a letter now tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Fuller, Fuller, you are being audited, right? <laughs> There's a little camera right there. I think it probably goes right to the NSA right now. Yeah. It actually goes to the nursery. But um, anyway, uh, where, where was I? He, 
the thing is is that when uh, when you uh, ha when you really understand the resurrection of Jesus and what it really means and that is that this guy who was just filled with love for everybody is now filling you you're filled with love and we're not as Christians our job is not to go out and tell people the wrong stuff that they do our job is to introduce them to a relationship with this wonderful Savior that we have and so I want you to take seriously the resurrection of Jesus Christ if you don't know him come to know him this morning if you do know him Rejoice and celebrate. That it is not some old, musty, dusty tradition that only people who are very backwards celebrate on this one day of the year. No. It is the way, the truth, and the life. And this day, we celebrate every day the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to come to grips with the resurrection. Help us to take it seriously. Help us to consider it. Help us to understand as much as we can about what it means to humanity and what it means to us individually. Give us clear thinking about you. Not muddled up with all the traditions that do exist and with all the things that the world says about you. Help us to understand what you say about you. Your words, your claims, your truth your resurrection and help us lord then to take that into ourselves and to become one of your disciples loving you belonging to you for all of eternity we want those resurrected bodies we want that eternal life we want to be good as you are good so lord we just give our lives afresh and anew to you Pray that we would celebrate Resurrection Sunday on every single day of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.